Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator, and today we're going to be talking about pole arms used incorrectly in games and wargaming miniatures and fantasy art and these kinds of things. So um, there are two principal things I'm going to be focusing on, and they both really, really bug me. One of them I've touched on before when I did a Lord of the Rings related video um, talking about the Easterlings, and that is the use of weapons like this bill, or indeed it could be a halberd or glaive or whatever, used with shields, because fundamentally these are two-handed weapons, so why would you have a shield? But that's a more complicated um, proposition than it first seems, and I'll talk about that a bit more. And secondly, the use of weapons like this, or particularly um, even things like this Dane axe, okay, or indeed this um, hewing spear used on horseback. Um, and not to say that they can't be used on horseback, and I'll be talking a bit about that in the video, but rather the way that they are represented being used on horseback. So keep on watching, uh, this is going to be a somewhat complex video talking about shields, pole weapons that cut and thrust, and uh, the use on horseback as well. But before I go on, I want to thank Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video, and they are the reason that you're not getting any other ads playing on here instead, interrupting your viewing pleasure. So what is Raid Shadow Legends? Raid is a free turn-based fantasy combat game. It's great fun to play. It's free to download, as I mentioned, and you can play it on your mobile or your PC. And there's over 400 different characters that you can collect, use, um, adapt, and modify and upgrade. I'm going to give you some tips here for new players and how to get into it and how to do well. So first tip is log in daily. You get daily rewards for logging in and completing certain quests. And the fact is that there's also programs for new players uh, which enable you to progress faster. So talking about daily login rewards, here they are. Here's mine I'm going to go and collect. Also every week you get one of these ancient shards. Who's it going to be? Ooh. Wow, I haven't seen that one before, so he's a slayer. So I just summoned three champions, and so if I go into my quests, we'll just show you where that is down here. If we go into quests, you'll notice that I've completed one of the quests, that is to summon three champions. When you summon three champions, you've now completed that quest, you can claim 5,000 gold and 100 XP. Also, don't forget to fight in the arena as well, because the rewards you get from that are really, really worth it. Let's have a little look at an arena fight. Oh no. Yes! Again, going through the quests, uh, you can see a red marker up there fighting the arena five times. I've just done that, so I get those rewards 100 XP, one potion, and two and a half thousand silver. I'll claim those, thank you. So, another top tip is don't spread out too thinly your uh, rewards. We'll focus on a few champions and get them really, really good, really, really quickly. I'll show you just really quickly how to upgrade one of your champions. So, if you go to the tavern here, you select one of the people you want to um, upgrade. I'm going to feed him, so to speak, uh, one of my other um, champions. And boom, he's now leveled up. So next top tip is when you start playing, play through the campaign missions. Uh, that's where you'll level up your characters, you'll get new artifacts, and you'll make them strong enough to be able to use them in person versus person um, arena fight. Yeah, but if we go into the campaigns, and then this is the campaign map. And so let's have a little look at some battles quickly. So my next top tip is as you really get the top level um, artifacts out of going into the dungeons where you fight really high level bosses. Um, so go and do the um, dungeon missions there, and you can see they're all along here. And this is where you really get like some really, really good artifacts. So go now to the link below in my description here, and you can download Raid Shadow Legends for free straight away onto your mobile or PC. And for new players, for the next 30 days only, for new players, you will get 100,000 silver plus 50 gems plus one energy refill and one free champion, the Adjudicator, which is a really good champion for new players. You can find your rewards up here in the treasure box by clicking there. If you need advice, you're not alone. Subscribe to the guide on the Teleria world and find out the whole truth about Raid Shadow Legends. Link in the description below. Thank you for your patience and thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the main topic at hand. What is it that actually annoys me so much about the way that weapons like this bill, um, or indeed this uh, Danax, or weapons like the 
uh, cutting spear, should we call it a hewing spear, this is a wing spear, hewing spear, goes by different names, um, or indeed in some cases large two-handed swords, what is it that annoys me about their use, particularly in uh, fantasy um, games, video games, but um, also even in TV and movies and also fantasy art and uh, role-playing games, wargaming as well, and wargaming's uh, very guilty of this. Now, I have spoken about one aspect of this topic in the past, the one that really, really annoys me, and it is where you see certain uh, characters um, given a weapon like this, it might be a halberd, it might be a, a bill like this, this is a bill in case you don't know, it might be some form of gisam or fauchard or um, these, sorts of, uh, these sorts of weapons that are primarily cutting and thrusting pole weapons that have a fair amount of heft to them. They're fairly large weapons primarily designed to be used in uh, two hands, okay? And that's the primary factor here. These aren't light and nimble spears. Uh, these are two-handed, relatively weighty cut and thrust weapons, okay? And w the thing that I've spoken about in the past that bugs me is when they are partnered up with shields, okay? Now, uh, when I spoke about this previously, I had a long old rant about the fact that it really bugs me that in, particularly, you see this even in old uh, Warhammer mi miniatures and stuff like this uh, in Wargaming, you see weapons like halberds and bills partnered up with shields, and I had a big old rant about how ridiculous this is uh, because you can't use this kind of weapon really with a shield, or can you? I'm going to come back to that in a second. Um, so hold that thought. But subsequently, I actually was looking through some medieval art and I completely fessed up to this. Some of you who follow the channel and follow the Facebook page, the Scholar Gladiator Facebook page, will uh, probably remember this. I fessed up basically because I found an original 15th century um, illustration of someone with a um, halberd in that case and a large pavis, a large shield. Um, now, that was very, very interesting, and it does appear, and I've criticised this also with Lord of the Rings, where we look at the, the Easterlings, um, as we call them, so this was one of my big criticisms, was the fact that they're carrying halberds and large shields, and a lot of people who uh, wanted to defend the great trilogy that that is, they wanted to defend it, understandably, and they kind of said, yeah, Matt, but they could have just carried those shields, um, and then when they got into close combat, they might have put the shields down, um, you know, maybe temporarily, whatever, drop them, put them to one side, and if needs be, and then uh, put their shield down wherever, and then use their weapons as two-handed weapons. Yes, absolutely, that could be done. And funnily enough, this 15th century um, illuminated manuscript, probably, that's probably what's happening there. Um, I don't know the context of that scene, whether it was a siege or a battle or just guarding or whatever, but if you imagine you're in a siege and your primary weapon is a bill or a halberd, okay, a multi-purpose two-handed polearm, Indeed, if you're in a siege, you are a primary target for missile uh, troops in the castle or on the fortification in the town, whatever. So crossbowmen, gunners, longbowmen, everyone like that, um, anyone with a spear they can throw, is going to be trying to wound and kill as many of the attackers as possible. So indeed, having something like a large shield or a pavis uh, to carry around during a siege, as well as your weapon, might be a good idea if, if as a commander, uh, you can afford to equip your troops that way, then indeed uh, that might make, uh, make some degree of sense. Can you actually use these sorts of weapons with a shield? Well, we, ne we try not to deal in absolutes here, okay? So generally speaking, I make the point, this is a two-handed weapon and is best used and was usually used and was designed primarily to be used in two hands, okay? It is, it is a weapon which obviously can uh, chop and hook. It can, uh, like a warhammer, it can spike through armor um, and possibly be used to hook as well on any part of a person's body. Um, and of course, it's got the spear function as well. And you've got a shaft, you've essentially got a quarter staff attached to it as well. Um, and it has some percussive effect um, hitting with the shaft. And indeed, you've got a back end that you can bring to bear if you need to. So it's a, it's a very, very versatile, very powerful, very potent weapon, much more, uh, much more potent in single combat than, uh, or in, in melee combat, than, than a sword, yeah? The sword would be the backup to something like this. But um, could you use it with a shield? Well, it might not be your preference, it might not be what you first want to do, or what it's designed to do, 
but technically you kind of could have, yes, okay? So in a way, this video, you're now wondering, well, like, what's the, so I've started a video rant about people using these with shields, but I'm trying to be as rounded and as fair here as possible. Could you possibly use, if this was the weapon that you happen to have to hand, and you have a pavis maybe because you know the opponent, uh, the opposing army are going to have lots of crossbowmen, for example, and your commander said, hey, have some pavises or you guys are going to get shot to pieces. Indeed, if you're coming in under fire and you're forced to use a weapon like this, can you use it? Well, kind of, yes. It's not very wieldy, it has to be said. You would probably be better off at that point dropping this and going to your backup weapon of your uh, single-handed sword. So if you did have bills, for example, and you had um, backup weapons like this, you might be better if you, if you want to keep in behind your shields uh, and keep away from the arrow fire coming in at you, you might be better off actually coming in with a sword at that point and going full Roman. Um, however, if you don't have swords, maybe, you, you know, maybe you, you haven't been equipped with swords, you've only been equipped with bills and you've got to make do with what you've got. You can use it as a, po as a pointy object and what you generally do, because these are fairly heavy and relatively unwieldy in one hand, you'd basically hold it further up so you've basically got a sword length um, blade in front of your hand. Uh, with a bit sticking out behind, and you could come in and basically use as a, as a, as a short spear, like an Asa guy. Um, so yes, you could theoretically use it with a shield, but it wouldn't be very effective, and trying to chop with it one-handed is really, I mean, <laughs> obviously you can't hold it back here and chop with it, because it's just too heavy and too unwieldy. If you hold it near the head and try and chop with it, it's just going to be, no, you've got too much counterbalance sticking out the back. Uh, however, you could probably use the spike to some degree for hooking, or the hook for hooking, uh, and definitely you can jab, you can thrust with it like you would be able to do with a sword. So can you use this with a shield? Yes, you can, but it's not really preferable, it's not really optimal. Um, so I want to be clear on that fact that whilst I think it's really annoying when you see wargaming miniatures or video game characters with something like a halberd or a bill and a shield, I think that's generally speaking idiotic, but we can sometimes excuse it in certain ways. But it certainly wouldn't usually be something that would be chosen as optimal. Okay, so that's the first thing. It's annoying when they put weapons like this with a shield. It doesn't make sense. If someone has shown with a halberd or a bill and a shield, that's generally speaking stupid even though I admit there is some historical art evidence for it. Can you use them together? Yes, you can, but it's not really what you choose to. Now, what's the second thing that annoys me? Well, as some of you watching this video, I suspect uh, recently, have been playing Bannerlord. Um, and I've been playing Bannerlord multiplayer online. I'm not very good, don't seek me out. Um, don't look at my stats. Um, but I'm <laughs> gradually, slowly creeping forward, getting slightly better. Uh, rather than just getting killed all the time, I'm now only getting killed, uh, my killed to death rate is only about 50-50 now. Um, but the main point is that something that bugs me, not just in Bannerlord, I have to say, this you can go back to the original Mountain Blade and Mountain Blade Warband, and you can go to other video games out there, I think probably uh, Maud Howe and Kingdom Come Deliverance and various other games are guilty of this as well. And that is the use of these sorts of weapons, not with a shield now, okay, but with, um, whilst riding a horse. Now, some of you will go, ah, oh, but Matt, I know that the Mongols, I know the Chinese, the Koreans, various other um, civilizations, cultures, particularly in Asia, did actually use glaives and naginata and weapons like this from horseback. Yes, that's true, okay? And uh, I'll come back to that a little bit in a second. In Europe, the weapons like the, you know, like the Bill or the Volge or the Fauchard or the, um, uh, the Halberd or things like this, pretty much weren't used on horseback. But could you use them on horseback? Yes, you could to some degree in the same way that I've just shown. So these are essentially front heavy, relatively unwieldable, at least in one hand, weapons. However, if that's all you've got available, if that's what you're forced to use and you're on horseback, the best way to use it basically is like a short spear, okay? You could theoretically couch it under the arm and use it as a fairly heavy and unwieldy lance, just about, okay? So yes, absolutely, you could use, 
you wouldn't want to, but you could use a bill or a halberd or a volge or whatever, or bardiche even, uh, on horseback as a pointy object, just as the same as you could use a pointy stick or anything else. Um, obviously, if you have a weapon which is primarily a cutting weapon, like the Dane Axe, then that becomes less of an option. If you're on, if you're on horseback and you have to use this one-handed, you're holding your reins here, can you use that like a spear? No, I mean, you could hit someone with it. Okay, it's gonna hit, you've got a sharp bit there and you've got a big blunt bit there. So yes, you could, with the speed of the horse and the force of the horse and maybe couching it or, or, or even not even couching it, um, but you could hit someone hard with that object and you can still hit them with it, but it's not gonna be as effective as a weapon which is more thrust centric, okay? And clearly, despite the fact that this is a hewing spear and this is a weapon designed to be used uh, this particular one anyway, uh, two-handed on foot, mostly for cuts and thrusts, and it's a very, very good and versatile weapon in that regard, much like a partisan. Um, if you had to use this on horseback, then you could use it simply as a spear or a lance, and this is, of these weapons that I've just shown now, is very appropriate. And I would also say the two-handed sword, I could grab that one as well, the bigger five-hander, but I use this one because it's to hand. Um, the two-handed sword, pretty unwieldy on horseback, but you could, indeed, and it is shown in treatises, couch it under the arm as well and use that like a lance. Um, so if you've got a particularly large sword that you can't really handle in one hand very well, you can still give point with it in, in whichever way you want to, or you can couch it under here, okay? So yes, you can use pretty much anything as a thrusting weapon, but what mostly irks me with Bannerlord and other similar games, is the use of these two-handed weapons. I'll pick the Danax for this illustration. The use of these two-handed weapons used pretty much in exactly the same way as you use them on foot, but whilst riding a horse. Now, why does that bother me? <laughs> well, there are two main things, okay? And these are things more to do with the way that the video game is put together rather than necessarily to do with history. So as I've mentioned, um, in some countries, in Japan, Korea, China, uh, Mongolia, various parts of Asia, and perhaps other parts of the world as well, perhaps very occasionally in Europe, um, cutting weapons were used as cutting weapons, two-handed, from horseback, okay? So we know, that the, we know that the Mongols and the Chinese and the Japanese did use glaives and naginata and various uh, types of weapon for cutting and thrusting from horseback. Um, but if you look at Bannerlord, you will find that you can ride a horse very, very well. You can ride a horse just as well as if you're holding the reins or not holding the reins, whilst using a big two-handed chopping weapon to enormous devastating effect from any angle and you never hit your horse, okay? So you can tell what my two issues are here, hopefully. I'll switch weapons now to this weapon because this is uh, the Manavlion or whatever it's called, the, the Empire version of this uh, weapon in Bannerlord is, um, is used as a cutting weapon. If you don't have a shield in Bannerlord, if you don't have a shield, it is used as a cutting weapon from horseback. And my two primary issues are, number one, if you drop your reins, so normally with a weapon, if you're using a lance or a one-handed sword on horseback, you hold the reins in your left hand. You might have a shield on your left arm as well, but you're holding the reins. So you've got your, your legs, your, your crotch and your knees and your feet in control of the horse, and you've got your left hand in control of the horse, okay? And those are all useful points of contact. If you let go of the reins, and yes, this was absolutely done, was done to use bows to, to do horseback archery, and it was done to use glaives and naginatas we've spoken about. If you do that, you are no longer in, for at least for most people, you are no longer in as much control of the horse as you would be if you're holding the reins. And anyone, someone could go, ah, oh, well, I can ride my horse without my reins just as well as if I hold the reins. Okay, there might be some people who train to a very high level to the point where they are as good on a horse without reins as most people are with reins. But let's face it, reins exist for a reason, okay? Otherwise, nobody would use reins on horses. So the fact is that reins on horseback are a useful thing. If you're a regular person who has a two-handed weapon and you decide to use that two-handed weapon, at the same time as riding a horse, your riding skill for most average people should go, should go down, okay? So that's my first complaint. My first complaint is that trying to use a two-handed 
cutting weapon from horseback, your riding ability should nosedive for most people, okay? You shouldn't be able to ride as nimbly and as well as someone who is holding reins with their left hand and operating a weapon with their right hand. Secondly, is the trajectories. Now, when you're operating any kind of weapon on horseback, you've got to be mindful of where the horse is. So if I just grab the one-handed sword for a second, when you cut, if you give a cut out here, you clearly don't want the cut to finish down there because you just hit your horse in the head, okay? Equally, if you're cutting over here, okay, you don't want to finish there, you've hit your horse in the head. Um, any direction that you're doing anything in, sitting on your horse, you want to be mindful of not hitting your horse in the body, but particularly in the neck and head because they, generally speaking, stick up a bit higher than the rest of the body, okay? Thrusts are less of a problem than cuts because cuts don't just stop dead. Usually they usually pass through an object and then carry on a bit through it. So with a two-handed weapon, the problem is in, a, and if I just switch to the two-handed sword, assuming you're a good enough horse rider that you can still ride your horse and put both your hands on your weapon, you have to model the movement of the weapon in such a way that you wouldn't behead your own horse or at least grievously injure your own horse because your horse Despite the fact that you're, you're imag uh, imagining you're a miraculous horseman who can ride as well as anybody else can without holding the reins, let's just assume you are, once you've hit your, hit your sword or your weapon, your axe or whatever you're wielding into your own horse, your horse is probably going to be even, you know, it's not going to be as compliant as it normally would be. So really those are my two main issues. Yes, technically you can use a large two-handed weapon from horseback. But number one, your riding skill, your relative riding skill is going to decline. Number two, your weapon uh, versatility is going to decline because you can't manoeuvre, you can't change feet, you can't move the hips around in the same way. You don't have the same range of movement, especially as you're trying to control a horse with your legs at the same time, as you do when you're on foot. So your riding ability would go down, your weapon ability would go down, but also your weapon versatility with the movements that you can do, the range of motion that you can actually follow through with, with a two-handed weapon on horseback, is much more narrow than it is on foot. So, there we go. To conclude, my issues with these sorts of weapons, I'll go back to the bill, my issues with these sorts of weapons in video games and Wargaming miniatures and all sorts of diver, you know, fantasy art, all sorts of diverse things. It's number one, partnered with shields. It may have happened sometimes. There might be some specific reason for doing it, but it's not really optimal. Um, and secondly, the use of these sorts of weapons, glaives and um, uh, manavlion, you know, cutting spears, hewing spears on horseback, really, really needs seriously considering. If you're putting it particularly into a video game, you need to consider how the riding skill would be affected, how the trajectories of the weapons would be affected to not hit your own horse, and uh, also your weapon skill as well. Um, if you just give people all the advantages with no disadvantages, what you end up with is a very OP operating um, system and very, very OP weapon, okay? And that is unfortunately what's happened in, particularly in Bannerlord I've witnessed recently. There are certain weapon combinations which are completely unbalanced uh, now and they don't reflect reality because they haven't put the corresponding disadvantages in to balance the advantages. Anyway, I hope this has been interesting for you to watch. Uh, give me your feedback below. I'd be really interested on your impressions, your ideas. Some of you out there, I'm certain, will be experienced horse riders. Um, and people like Jason Kingsley, if you're watching that uh, this out here, I'd be interested in you to weigh in on this topic um, and the use of two-handed weapons from horseback. Um, at some point, we're definitely going to uh, meet up and do some filming together, so maybe that's something we could look at. It'd be quite fun. Um, but anybody else who's a skilled rider, I'd be interested in your feedback from that perspective. Any other input or thoughts on the use of the shield with these sorts of weapons? Uh, and finally, also, I'd be interested to know your feedback of Bannerlord. What do you think of it so far? I've got to be uh, honest, I am enjoying the game, but there are some things, I might make a video specifically about this, but there are some things, probably about 10 things, that really, really annoy me about it, and I hope they change. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Thanks again to uh, Raid for sponsoring this video. That's why you've had no other ads in this vid. Um, and uh, go and check out the link below, as always. 
Um, but also, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe, um, uh, like the video, share it around, and I'll see you really soon again on Scholar Gladiatora channel um, for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.